于加那个文革的我我们的书的内容。And what matters to me、uh, in twenty minutes would be to speak briefly about what、uh, leads up to the Cultural Revolution, and then very much talk about four different periods. We tend to talk about. Cultural revolution, either as a three-year period, 66 to roughly 69, or as a sort of you know ten-year drama that unfolds. But there are very, very different、um, periods in that. I will talk very briefly about the early years from 62 to 66.、Um, then I will talk about what I call the red years, 66 to 68, followed by the black years when the military turned this country into. Um, a dictatorship,、um, and then after the death of Lin Biao from September 71 to the very death of the man himself in 76,、um, I will talk about those as the grey years. Grey is、uh, not white, not black, exactly reason for it. Well, where do we start? Always、oh, very difficult for a historian. Maybe February 1956, when Khrushchev. Of course, denounces Stalin and the crimes he committed、uh, under his reign. Now, Mao sees Khrushchev's attack on Stalin as an attack on himself.、Um, not only that,、uh, but two years later, Khrushchev proposes the notion of peaceful evolution, which Mao sees as a betrayal of. True principles of revolutionary communism. Now, I don't know what Mao thought. Nobody will know that. But he must have spent a great amount of time thinking about how one <coughs> single man, Khrushchev, the Khrushchev, Khrushchev, could somehow engineer a complete reversal of policy in the mighty Soviet Union. If Stalin has been able to defeat Hitler and the Nazis, invade half of Europe, and one man in 1956 completely undermines his entire legacy, how? Mao must have thought that there was something not so much with capitalists who had been overthrown already in 1917, but something to do with capitalist ideas. Capitalism was gone. But there were feudal, superstitious, bourgeois, capitalist ideas that somehow allowed a very few people, like Nikita Khrushchev, to transform that entire structure from the bottom down. That's one idea. But of course,、um, Mao wasn't only concerned、um, about Khrushchev. Was very much concerned about also using the Cultural Revolution to preserve、um, his own legacy and become the one <coughs> leader of the socialist camp who goes far beyond not only Khrushchev but Stalin himself. The very first attempt by Mao to steal the thunder of the Soviet Union. And become the one leader who takes the socialist camp into communism. That first attempt is, of course, the great leap forward from 1958 to 1960. True, by transforming every man, every woman in the countryside into a foot soldier in a giant army to work day and night. Mao thought he could transform the economy. And of course, make him the Messiah, leading not just China but the entire socialist camp into a world of plenty for all. Well, you know what happened. The Great Leap Forward wasn't utopia. It was a disaster that cost the lives of tens of millions of people. So, to some extent. You could say that the Cultural Revolution really is Mao's second attempt to become again the leader of the socialist camp. The 
first revolution, from that point of view, was carried out by Lenin in 1917, the great October Socialist Revolution, got rid of that capitalist class of people. But as I said earlier on, the issue now is about capitalist culture, bourgeois ideas. So now, with the Cultural Revolution, is the one who will initiate a second revolution, the great proletarian cultural revolution, the second stage of that much greater revolution towards communism, making him the one who inherits, defends, develops the whole body of Marxism, Leninism, into something called Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought. Now, these are grandiose ideas, but of course Mao also uses the Cultural Revolution to get rid of his enemies. That, after all, is what dictators do. Now, already after Khrushchev's report in 1956, um, the very idea of Mao Zedong thought is written out of the Constitution. Mao is not very pleased, but his star is at its lowest. In January 1962, when some 7,000 cadres convened in Beijing to discuss the disaster of the Great Leap Forward. At this point, Mao's reputation is probably at its very lowest. There are rumors going around the world. There are probably leading officials who would want him to take responsibility for the disaster that he has caused, or even to step down. Mao goes on the counter-attack in August 1962. This is the very first part of my book, referred to the early years. 1962 to 1966 are the early years. It is not possible to understand the Cultural Revolution without going back to these early years, which are very much characterized by one campaign, or many campaigns, but the key one here is the Socialist Education Campaign. Socialist education campaign. Educate people about the benefits of socialism after the disaster of the Great Leap Forward. Liu Shaoqi takes command of this campaign in 1963, veers even more to the left than the chairman himself presides over the punishment of some 5 million party members. Entire provinces are accused during the socialist education campaign of having taken the capitalist road. Leaderships of provinces like Guizhou are taken down. The talk is all about Duoquan to seize power. There's almost a cultural revolution without the term cultural revolution. But there's more to it. Mao wishes not only to eradicate so-called capitalist practices of the countryside, he wishes to educate young people. Ying Biao is the one who promotes the cult of Mao Zedong, distributes the Little Red Book, and also uses the PLA to promote a martial atmosphere in schools, whether it is small children, high schools, university students, all of them have to read about class hatred and class war there. That's part of the social education campaign. So by the time that we are in May, June 1966, many young people have already read for many years about class enemies, and they are itching to find them. So when the true red years start in 1966, to be precise, on the 1st of June 1966, when the People's Daily publishes an incendiary editorial called Sweep Away All Monsters and Demons, the students are ready to find a class enemy. This is the start of the Red Reviews. They go around finding enemies, as we just saw earlier on, punishing the teachers. But if you go too far and take to task party members, they're punished by work teams sent in by Deng Xiaoping, Liu Shaoqi, who are in charge of the Cultural Revolution over the summer in June and July, not just on the start away. He returns to the capital in the middle of July. Instead of supporting Deng Xiaoping, Liu Shaoqi, he turns against them, denounces them for trying to establish a dictatorship, and 
suppressing the students. So far, Yori. The revenge is justified. It becomes the rallying cry of those students who transform themselves into red guards and vow to carry out the revolution and defend the chairman. This is August, red August, as homes are ready. People are taken to task. But it was a small issue. Mao wanted to use the Red Guards to attack people in the higher echelons of power, not ordinary people. And of course, party officials are not stupid. They've gone through decades of political infighting that honed their survival skills. They use their own Red Guards to oppose the Red Guards. The parliament of the time, this is called raise the red flag to fight the red flag. And the red guards themselves become divided over who the true enemies of the Cultural Revolution really are. So before you know it, red guards are fighting each other instead of taking down some of these leading officials suspected of being capitalist rulers. Now, in the autumn, unleashes the people, much is used to students over the summer, now he wants to broaden the Cultural Revolution and have people stand up and join the revolution. It is a social explosion on an unprecedented scale. And ordinary people all of a sudden are allowed to stand up and denounce the local power or make a complaint to somebody up in Beijing. People can travel, print, criticize, attack anybody inside the party. And many are very discontented about communism. But here too there is a problem. These so-called revolutionary masses who now had hoped would sweep away all the enemies of the revolution become divided too. The army has to intervene on the orders of Mao in January, February 1967. The army is divided too, not knowing who the true enemies are. They support different factions. These different factions arm themselves. They start battling each other in the street with machine guns on a few occasions with anti-aircraft artillery. These are the red years. For now, use the people to attack the party. These red years come to an end in August 1968. New revolutionary party commitments appear everywhere. These so-called revolutionary party committees are heavily dominated by the military. There are soldiers everywhere overseeing schools, universities, factories, offices. And they turn this country into a garrison stick. From 1968 to 1971, what I call the Black Years, the military are very much in control and turn this country into a classic military dictatorship. Now, quite pleased with the command structure, the orders can be carried out right away. The military start purging all those who spoke out at the height of the Cultural Revolution, the Red Years. They stand literally millions of people to the countryside. Including, of course, all the students who actually expressed their faith in Mao in those red years. Not only that, but once millions have been sent away to the countryside to be re-educated by the students, the revolutionary party committee Start a nationwide witch hunt. The talk is no longer was a part of that. The, the talk is no longer about capitalist rulers or bourgeois elements. It's about traitors, spies, renegades. Special committees are set up to examine the alleged enemy links of ordinary people and party members alike. In a city like, like Shanghai, hundreds of thousands of people are harassed by this campaign. Some 5,000 are literally hounded to their deaths. In 
Guangdong, one scholar puts the death toll at 40,000. The heart of darkness is probably in Inner Mongolia. Some 800,000 people are arrested, imprisoned, interrogated, denounced in mass meetings, many of them tortured. The vast majority of the victims are Mongols, although they only constitute about 10% of the population in Inner Mongolia. Now, of course, now was suspicious of everybody, and now becomes suspicious of the army, which has acquired so much clout during these black years. Whoever controls the army can turn it against number one, the China himself. Ding Biao disappears in a mysterious plane crash in September 1971, marking the end of the black years. So, at this stage, the army itself becomes a victim of the Cultural Revolution. The army is purged. The soldiers go back to the barracks. It is what I call the start of the Grey Years. In the countryside in particular, people realize that the party has badly damaged itself. The credibility of the party have been damaged during the Great Leap Forward, its very organization undermined by the Cultural Revolution. The army is gone. The carvers no longer have the, the credibility they used to have. So, in what I refer to as a silent revolution, ordinary villagers start using whatever leeway they have to get back to what they wanted to do, namely go back to the market. They open black markets. They trade in goods they always wanted to trade in. They plant crops they think will work better than the ones assigned by a carver. In Yenan, a small village, Yenan, the hallowed phase of revolution, entire villages with the help of carvers produce nothing but pigs. They raise pigs illegally, sell the meat on the black market illegally, use the meat to buy back grain on the black market illegally to fulfill their obligations to the state in terms of grain procurements. That's one small example. But then provinces like Zhejiang, up to a third of all farmers by the middle of the 1970s are already so-called Dangan, goers of loneliness. It is a sign of revolution on a gigantic scale. Not only that, but many of these farmers start operating underground factories in a place like Chuanshan, just outside of Shanghai, where the state mandates that they should produce cotton. Uh, by 1975, the industrial output already represents some 75% of all production. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that many people in the countryside have had enough of Maoism and the command economy. And they undermine it. They use whatever little freedom they have to undermine the command economy, to divide collective assets, to claim back the land. Mao dies in 1976. Deng Xiaoping, in 1979, briefly tries to force people to go back to the collectives. It's too little, too late. At this point, in some provinces, like Anhui, Gansu, Guizhou, up to half of all land is already in the hands of individual households. The true architects of economic reform are ordinary people, not Deng Xiaoping. But Deng Xiaoping is clever enough to use it and use the economic growth that comes with decollectivization of the people's communities disappear in 1982 to rebuild the party. But now, of course, the situation is very different. People have been able to wrench away very basic economic freedoms from the state. The freedom to travel, the freedom to grow crops they want, the freedom to trade on markets. But as much as those very basic economic freedoms are allowed, the one-party state under Deng Xiaoping is determined to suppress all of 
other political aspirations. So in 1989, firstly orders the tanks into Beijing to suppress pro-democracy demonstrators on Tiananmen Square. It is a pretty, pretty brutal massacre, which sends a very clear message, one that pulsates to this very day, including in a place like Hong Kong. And that message is, do not ever query the monopoly on power of the one-armed state. Thank you.